Randomized controlled trials are also going to be much easier. One of the amazing things about education is how little we know. How little we know about what actually works. And one of the reasons is that it's very expensive to do randomized controlled trials. So if you look in the education literature, they're doing RCTs with like 30 students, 50 students. Because they're expensive, they're hard to do. In the <coughs> online world, it's very simple to have two different videos. One teaches elasticity using one method. The other teaches elasticity using another method. You flip a coin as students come to the site. 50% of the students get one set of videos. 50% of the students get another video. And then you can track them. See what happens on their homework. See what happens on the test. See what happens on the final. We can do combinations and permutations. All kinds of different experiments running at the same time all can be analyzed to figure out what actually works. Which subjects does this work for? Clearly, visual subjects is going to work very well. Things like uh, physics, uh, economics, statistics, mathematics, media study. Uh, modern contemporary American poetry. What? What? Really? Well, I'm pretty surprised too, actually. Um, but here is uh, some reviews. This is from Al Phil Rice's Modern and Contemporary American Poetry. It's a course he taught to 30,000 students. Okay. This is a, not quite a random selection, but it's not a highly uh, cherry-picked selection either. I think this is the most interesting and fulfilling studying experience of my life. A journey through American poetry. This is from a student from Central Macedonia, Greece. This class has exceeded my expectations in every possible way. This course is amazing. I'm rethinking all my ideas about modern contemporary American poetry. I have many first editions of the poets and books, and I'm really reading again all this stuff. It's an amazing process, vivid and fruitful. I'm discovering poems I didn't know. I'm rediscovering those poems familiar to me. One of the best learning experiences I remember. This is a student from Stockholm, Sweden. These are students who would otherwise not have the uh, ability to take a class from someone like uh, Al Philrice. It's pretty amazing. This is at least as exciting, as wonderful, as life-transforming an educational experience as we all want to produce in our classrooms. And it can be done online. It's not just mechanical. It's not just uh, uh, chalk and talk. It can be transform transformative. All right. So that's the creative. Let's talk about the destruction. Clearly with this leverage, the ability of one professor to reach, or one teacher to reach, many more students than ever before. This raises the question of how many teachers are we really going to need? Superstar teachers are going to be much more common. This is Kim Kehoon. He is a teacher in uh, Korea, in South Korea. He actually teaches mostly uh, English. Uh, online using videos, he earns $4 million a year selling online lessons. He has created a brand. He has a, a hierarchical structure of uh, TAs and, and so forth working for him. When we have an increase in the size of the market, which one person can reach, small differences in quality are magnified. Small differences in quality are magnified by the size of the market. So if you have a choice between someone who is the 90th percentile and someone who's at the 95th percentile, if you're going to go for the 95th, you may as well. So even small differences in quality mean much larger differences in uh, the market, in the size of that person's audience. You know, people have always said, great teachers deserve our respect. Great teachers should be highly rewarded. People have been upset. Why? Why do we pay our teachers so little when we pay these sports stars so much? Well, I have some news. We're going to pay our teachers like sports stars, too. But just like sports stars, we're not going to be that many of them. Online teaching reduces the marginal cost of teaching and raises the fixed cost. And by marginal costs, I mean we have low marginal costs in the online world. Low cost of an additional student, okay, we can easily scale from 100 to 1,000 to 100,000. 
and low cost of teaching the uh, course the second, the third, the fourth time. You have that, of course, a lower cost in the offline world, but even more so in the online world. Once the course is being created, easy to teach it again and again. High fixed costs. Uh, this is mostly in the form of quality. So the animations, the guidance, the teaching AI, the systems, the TAs, all of this is going to be very expensive to put together. The price of courses will be low, and the competition is going to be in quality. And most importantly, these fixed costs are endogenous. Endogenous fixed costs in the model of John Sutton and of uh, IO. What that means is they're going to grow with competition. Competition a la newspapers rather than a la restaurants. So think about the following. So you compare um, like Dubuque uh, with uh, New York City and you look at restaurants, New York City has many more restaurants, uh, much more variety, but none of the restaurants dominate the market. You just get more of them, more restaurants in New York City. But what about newspapers? Okay. New York City does not have more newspapers than much smaller cities. Only get a handful. So even as the size of the market grows, there are some industries where you do not get dispersion, you do not get increased numbers of firms. Instead, what happens is in New York City, you get the New York Times, you get the leader invests more in quality. So the New York Times, it wins more Pulitzers. It has a bigger Sunday section. It covers more areas of the world. It has a bureau in China. It covers uh, uh, entertainment. It, it does a broader reach. The Sunday section is bigger and so forth. So you get investments in quality so that New York City has better newspaper, but not more. I think we're going to see very much the same thing in uh, education. And we can actually see this already by comparing the market for courses with the market for textbooks. So there's about 8,000 teachers and principals of economics uh, in the United States. What about textbooks? Well, uh, the top four take about 50% of the market. You're probably familiar with some of these. Oh, I'm sorry, there seems to be some error. <laughs> I see the problem. Ah, oh, there we go. Much, much better. So what I think is going to happen is that courses will be produced much more like textbooks. So how is a textbook produced today? It's a team production. You have authors with their names on the front cover, but you've got people working on the PowerPoints. Where's Selena? Great people on the PowerPoints. Okay, part of the team. You've got uh, people, you've got the sales force, you've got the graphic designers, you've got artists, you've got people working on the, uh, the test bank. You have a team production. Future courses will have all of these things and much, much more. Animators, sound effects producers, video production uh, artists, psychologists, educational psychologists, and so forth. In fact, if you want to think about what the future of course production, I think, is going to look like, video games. And I say this not in the sense of trivializing. Not, that's not my point at all. Think about a video game like uh, Halo. You spent about $100 million producing this game with actors, sound people, programmers, animators, all of these people working together in a team, even psychologists. What do the psychologists do with the video game? Well, what they do is they track hundreds of hours of people playing this video game, and they look for the places where people get really frustrated because it's too hard. They're not, they're not achieving. They're not moving forward. And they look for the places where people get really bored, where it's too easy. And they create a video game which walks that fine line between frustration, but also having that feeling of achievement, challenge. You also want challenge. You want people to feel that they are progressing, they are achieving. 
exactly the same thing that we want to produce in our courses, to walk that line between frustration and challenge, keeping them on that achievement goal. So I think this is a good place actually to uh, conclude because this picture to me, it's a little bit awesome, it's also a little bit scary. Thank you very much.